2 John. We begin our reading this morning at verse 7 and read down through the end of the book. Verse 7 of 2 John. Of course, it is just one chapter. Here, we've covered the first six verses of this, and as I've said before, it is more of a condensed version of some of the things that John has spoken of uh, in 1 John that we study. And uh, we're going to also this morning touch upon uh, some doctrine that, that he had spoken of in, in 1 John also. Beginning at verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face to you, that, your, that our joy may be full. And children of your left sister, greet you. Amen. Amen. So John, as we said, writing this letter to this group of believers is again affirming really those doctrines, making a reaffirmation of those things that he spoke of in 1 John. I do not know exactly how long after, but I, I take it that this letter came soon after 1 John. Perhaps to a different church, perhaps to the same church. But he touches upon this again, and he moves from what we saw last week in verse 6, which spoke of uh, agape love. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. In other words, that true Christian love means obedience to the Father, obedience to the commands of Scripture. And so John moves from the marks of believers, which is agape love and right doctrine he moves on from that to the marks of what we would call false prophets false doctrine particularly the doctrine of the denial of the deity and humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ if you remember John dealt with this doctrine if you look back and I'm not going to read all of that we may touch upon that some back in 1 John chapter 2 there in verses 18 through 23 where he talks about you know you hear that the antichrist is coming but even now there are many antichrists that have come and so what he's speaking of here is not the antichrist but different antichrist uh, any prophet that comes along and teaches false doctrine about Christ particularly those that deny the deity of Christ and deny the humanity of Christ uh, are antichrist that's right. It is the message of Antichrist, is what he is saying here. And this was being taught by John because of those who had arisen even within the church with teachings known as Gnosticism. Now before I get to that, remember that the Apostle Paul, when he said goodbye to the church at Ephesus, he gave them a warning. In Acts chapter 20, and Verses 29 and 30, he said, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Of course, the wolves being false teachers, the flock being the church. And he said, and also, even from among yourselves, within the church, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And this was what was happening within the churches. Is that false doctrine was being disseminated even within the church by those who had been a part of the church. And the, the great heresy of that day was what we call Gnosticism. It comes from a Greek word that means knowledge. In other words, they saw themselves as having some type of 
higher knowledge or more elevated knowledge and look down upon those that were not of the same opinions and doctrine as themselves. It was probably the most dangerous heresy of the church in the first 300 years. The first three centuries of the church. And basically what Gnosticism taught was a dualism, what we would call it. That said matter or flesh was inherently evil. And that the spirit was good and pure. And so therefore, Jesus certainly could not have come in real flesh as a real man because that would have made him evil because he would have been in the flesh. And so out of this came a teaching that, what, that denied the true humanity of Christ. Now we believe in, and I'll use this big word here, and some of you have heard me use it before, what's called the hypostatic union. What that means is that Jesus was God and man at the same time. That's right. They denied that doctrine. Amen. They denied that doctrine. And one of the teachings that came out of this was also what we call docetism. In the docetics, what and that word comes out of the word that it says means to appear. An appearance. The docetics taught that Jesus' physical body only seemed or appeared to be real. He said, well, what is the problem with this teaching? Well, again, if it denies, if they're in denial about Jesus being the God-man, then it denies the reality of the atonement. Amen. Because you cannot have an atonement. You cannot have a reconciling of God and man without the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament, the Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sin. The shedding of the blood of Christ is essential to the gospel. It is essential to a salvation. It is essential to our eternal life. Amen. The payment for our sins. And there was only one blood that could satisfy God the Father, and that was the blood of His holy and pure Son. And you cannot have that if you do not have a real human Jesus. Right. He did not just appear to have a body. He had a real body. He did not just appear to suffer. He really suffered. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And so to deny that doctrine is to deny the essential doctrine of the atonement and to deny the essential doctrine of, of Jesus as God and man at the same time. Wow. And so, this is why John defended the humanity of Christ so vigorously. If you look back at the beginning of 1 John chapter 1, and we read this passage several times because it is vital to, really, it is really the foundation for what John teaches through 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. He lays the foundation here. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the Word of life. He's not just talking about some philosophy there. He's talking about a person. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. The life was manifested. And we have seen it, bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. He came down here. He was manifested to us in reality in human form. That which we have seen, we've seen Him with our eyes. That which we have heard, we've heard His voice. We declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You notice they're uniting the, the Father and the Son there. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Then you go on to chapter 4 of 1 John, and there in the first three verses. John there says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. In other words, what spirits is he talking about? Well, the, 
these that come along and say, well, I have some new teaching. How do you know if somebody's of the right spirit? He says, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and then they're still here, by the way. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Here's the litmus test. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of what? The Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. I mean, almost immediately upon the birth of the church comes false doctrine into the church to corrupt the church. But you see, John was passionate about this doctrine of the humanity and the deity of Christ in one person. Our salvation and our eternal life and our eternal redemption are based upon this fact that the God named Jesus Christ who is God, who was God, who never stopped being God even in His earthly ministry came in the flesh and He shed His blood and He died for sinners. Yes. Amen. Right. And this is why that John was so vigorous in his defense of this doctrine. Amen. And let me say this, you cannot in reality deny this doctrine without denying the full efficacy of the atonement of Christ. Amen. If you deny this doctrine, you deny the atonement of Christ. And one of these things, he uses this term here, many deceivers, and the, and the word here can also mean imposter or seducer, which is what they are. Mm -hmm. They are imposters. Right. They are seducers. Liars. Mm -hmm. But if you look at these, these deceivers and these imposters or seducers, whatever you want to call them, they will almost always have a redemption that is not based upon solely upon the death of Christ and the shedding of His blood and His atonement, but it is based upon human works. Mm -hmm. right. They say, well, and they'll even do, well, you know, that was good that God sent His Son and He shed His blood, but you've got to add human works to that. To accomplish, to fulfill the purpose. No, when Christ died on the cross, that was an atonement for His people. We have obtained eternal redemption. It is an eternal redemption that we have as His children. Now very often these deceivers, as they were I'm sure in John's day, will often have a very good imitation of Christianity. They will use buzzwords. They'll talk about Jesus. And they will talk about grace even sometimes. And they will talk about salvation. But to qualify and you question them further, you will realize that they don't believe in the same Jesus that the Christian church does. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in the same way of salvation by the grace of God like Christianity does or like true Christianity does. So, why should we be surprised about this? We should not be surprised about this. I mean, Satan is able to make his ministers sound like Christian preachers and teachers. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and and Paul spoke upon this in verses 13 and 15. He said, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing that his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. You, many times people are astounded about some of these cults that are able to have so many followers, thousands and millions of followers. How can they do this? Because the ministers that he calls, that he has, look up somewhat, at least to their eyes, like Christian ministers. But they're deceived. If you closely examine their teachings and what they particularly believe about Jesus Christ, you will know that they are not. Amen. Jehovah's Witnesses talk about Jesus. 
They don't believe the same thing about Jesus that you and I do. No. No. Mormons will. No. They don't believe the same thing about Jesus that you and I do. Right. And others out there. This doctrine and those who teach it, let me say this. I've heard they say, well, you know, they're, they're just very sincere. And, you know, if you look at their, at their lives, they are good people. And they're just a little bit misguided, like somehow that they're innocent of their deeds. <coughs> Let me say this. They are not innocent. Amen. They are, as John says, a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, folks, that's a serious charge. That comes from the apostle <coughs> through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said this. And it is a it is dangerous doctrinal heresy. Let me say this. It is dangerous doctrinal heresy which we should as a church expose Amen. Uh, yes. and proclaim. We should proclaim it as false and eternally condemning because it does. If you follow that way of salvation, if you follow a way of salvation that is not based upon the, the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ and His work of the Holy Spirit in your life that has given you eternal life, you will not go to heaven. And those who follow that Doctrine will be condemned. Men and, men and women believe and follow this false doctrine. They will spend an eternity in hell. And those who have preached this doctrine will not be held unaccountable. Amen. They will be judged by God. Amen. And John exposed it because of the eternal seriousness of this. Right. And because it would corrupt the church if it was tolerated within the church. And let me say this. Our calling, and our duty as a church individually and as the church corporately, wherever God has His true churches, is to preach right doctrine and to expose false doctrine. That's right. Amen. Because the scripture says that if we will not be held unaccountable if we hold back from proclaiming that which is true and not warning others about that which is not true. Amen. In a false way of salvation. And our calling is to do that. And those, particularly in this church, is to preach and to teach the word the truth concerning Christ, concerning salvation, concerning the Christian life, and to expose heresy whenever mm -hmm. we come across it in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. When it ever re rears its ugly head. I, I, I think of, of what Paul wrote to Timothy. Here was Paul coming to the end of his life. In those pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy chapter 4. You know, and he says there in verse 1, he says, the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to these deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That's what he calls these heresies. Deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons. If you look at verse 13, he said to Timothy, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. We are to give ourselves to the reading of the Word, to the exhortation from the Word of God, of the truth of God, and to doctrine, Amen. to teaching. Yeah. One of the things that my calling as a pastor is to do is to exhort you to read and to study and to be changed by the truth of God. And he said, do not neglect this gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the, doc the doctrine. Again, he mentions doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing 
This you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Amen. Right. See, my calling as a pastor and those that preach and teach the Word of God is to proclaim these truths to you for their own sake and for your sakes also. Mm -hmm. And then in 2 Timothy, again, the last letter that, that Paul wrote, this is the last chapter of, of the inspired Word of God that he wrote. This is the last, the last exhortations that he gives. He says, I charge you there in chapter 4. First one, I charge you therefore before God. Not before myself, but before, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead in His appearing and His kingdom. What does He say? Preach the Word. Amen. He didn't say get up in the pulpit and tell jokes. Mm -hmm. Tell emotional stories. He said preach. Proclaim mm -hmm. the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, you be prepared all the time to speak the Word of God and speak the truth of God. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It was upon them. That according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn away their, their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables but no matter if they are, he says, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Mm -hmm. In other words, no matter whether what whether the truth of God is popular to those around you, you continue to hold to it, you continue to preach it, you continue to teach it, you continue to convince and rebuke and exhort the people of God as I have called you to do. Amen. Amen. What he says. And that's why this was so important to him. Verse 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Look to yourselves. In context, I think that the warning that he gives here is a warning against doctrinal error and tolerating doctrinal error. Uh, and to the extent that if you do so, he says, you're going to lose some of your, his or her Christian reward. Now, I understand that the Scripture talks about our rewards as believers. There is, there is Scripture there. And, and even the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 11 and 12 uh, said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds or manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And, and 1 Corinthians 3 and 8 and following there talks about the foundation that was laid and building on that foundation in relationship to, to our reward there as believers. There's the reward. I don't know. I don't think it's going to be material things. It's going to be spiritual rewards I think in heaven. And there's, so there's a reward for individual believers, but John was saying that some of that reward can be lost. He was giving a warning that if we participate in or tolerate false doctrine such as this, that in some way we enable it to permeate the church, that we don't speak out against it when we have opportunity as we ought, then we will lose some of our reward. Right. Is what he says there. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul talks about that. Verse 18 there. He said, let no one cheat you of your reward. And then in James chapter 5, and verse 19, James said, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know he has turned a sinner from the error of his way. So there again, we can wander from the truth and, and lose some of that reward. That's what he's talking about there. As I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how in this day, one of the key words for our day is tolerance. Mm -hmm. That we are supposed to tolerate all viewpoints, religious, political, and all lifestyles 
as valid as having merit. But let me say this. As the church, we are called to guard the truth. That's right. You see, this is this book is not mine to do with as I please. Now, there are some things that I read in it sometimes, and and, and I and I come across it, and I'm about to preach it, and I'm thinking, hmm, Lord, you know, this is tough. This is hard. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, because that's what I've called you to do. Mm -hmm. Right. In Philippians one and seventeen. Paul said that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. Those that have been called to preach and teach God's word have been appointed for the defense of the gospel to defend it. Mm -hmm. And much of what Paul had to say, of course, to Timothy as we <coughs> just read that was for the defense of the gospel, for the purity of the word, and the sanctity of the doctrine of the word of God. <coughs> May I say this, and I say it out of love, but not all religious viewpoints are true and valid mm -hmm. Valid that comes to the person of Christ and salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was saying here. Mm -hmm. We are not to give validity to false doctrine. Mm -hmm. We are not to condone false doctrine. If somebody denies the deity of Christ, we are to state they deny the deity of Christ. They don't believe in the true Jesus of the Bible. If they deny the full atonement of Christ, we are to state they preach a false gospel. <laughs> we are to stand for the truth of church as the scripture says, is the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. And we are to stand for that. What was, as we've been reading on Sunday mornings before the prayer service, those letters to the seven churches, and two of them got commendations, and five of them did not, and the five that got, that got basically disciplined are spoken of against by the Lord Jesus Christ, it was for doctrinal error. Mm. It was for wrong doctrine. That's right. I believe this, that when churches begin to tolerate and preach wrong doctrine concerning Christ and concerning salvation, if they don't repent of that, then I believe, as Jesus said in that, I'll close your doors. Yeah. I mean, they may have a building up, but in essence, Christ has already closed the door. Right. When they stray from the truth and they have not paid heed to His rebuke. Yeah. And so John was saying here that it is vitally important to not lose the things we work for, to receive the full reward. We need to guard the truth and proclaim that which is false. <coughs> Verse 9, he says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And this is something that we have covered in 1 John quite extensively. He states it very plainly here. Those who do not hold to a proper doctrine of Jesus Christ, His deity, His humanity, His saving work, does not know God or possess salvation or have a true hope of eternal life. Amen. He has never been born again. You cannot deny the essential doctrine of the deity of Christ, His atoning death, that He is God Himself, He is one with the Father, and possess the Holy Spirit. Those that have been born of the Spirit of God, who is called also the Spirit of truth, will speak to the truth of Scripture. Amen. They will agree with the truth of Scripture. If they do not, they do not know God. He says it plainly here. Yeah. Right. They've never been born again. No one born who is not no one born of the Holy Spirit of God will deny who Christ who really is and what he has done. And again, we look back to 1 John and even to the Gospel of John, where this is stated categorically in 1 John chapter 2. 
verses 22 and 23. And let me say this. John probably uses a whole lot stronger language than I use. Mm -hmm. Who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, the anointed one of God. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. In other words, if you deny the Son, you're denying the Father. Whoever denies the Son, him as the deified God man, the God man, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. To believe in the Son is also to believe in the Father. But to deny the Son, to deny the deity of Christ, to deny His full atonement is to deny the Father also. You cannot say that you have one without the other. And we know from back in the Gospels and some of those, uh, in the, particularly in the Gospel of John, what did Jesus say? And, and what did John say there regarding Jesus? And over and over and over again, if you read through the Gospel of John, you will see the deity of Christ affirmed over and over and over again. His equality and oneness with the Father. In John chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, what? He has declared it. Yes. He declares it. John 3, 16 through 18. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whoever believes in Him should not perish and have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. He believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe in Him, in Jesus Christ, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We go on and on throughout the Gospel of John. But you cannot deny the essential doctrine of the deity of Christ and call yourself a child of God. To deny Christ is to deny the Father. They are both fully God. Then verse 10, what does he say? If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine that he's been speaking of here, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. The nature, I believe, of Christians is a nature of love, of hospitality. In Romans 12 and 13, 1 Timothy 3 and 2, it speaks there of Christian hospitality. We're, we're to be hospitable as the people of God. But, in this case, John says, do not be hospitable toward those who bring false doctrine to your door. They come to your door. He says, if you do so, you are aiding them in the spread of their heresy, of their false doctrine. And I hear this said many times, oh, don't you admire their fervor. Those that, let's be honest, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons that come and knock on doors, bringing their heresy. We are not to say, I will pray for you. Godspeed. Bless you. According to the Scriptures. To do so, is to partake in, he says, their evil deeds, sir, and in their evil work. As much as we might have a heart of compassion for people and hospitality for people, we are not to condone the work of the Antichrist, which is what it is in that. Now, if you can preach the gospel to them, the true gospel, God gives you that opportunity, then God bless you. Mm -hmm. God bless you. I'll say <laughs> But we are not, as the Scripture says, as John says, to bless them, to show them hospitality in their work that we would show to others. Because they are actively seeking 
to preach a false doctrine and a heretical doctrine and the doctrine of the Antichrist. Our aid, our prayers, and our support is to be for those who proclaim the true person and the true work of Jesus Christ and preach the gospel of grace. Those are the ones that we're to aid. Those are the ones that we should be praying for and being hospitable to. And then he says in the last two verses here, Having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink. I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. John says here, I have a lot of things that I want to say to you. He says, rather than writing it down and sending it in a letter, he says, my desire is to come to you and to speak these things to you. And to have that joy, I believe, of Christian fellowship together in the truth. There's nothing like fellowship that is centered around truth. That is centered around the truth of Christ and the person of Christ. See, I love our, our fellowship here. I love the fellowship last Sunday. True Christian fellowship is when that joy is expressed when we're talking about our Lord. Mm, amen. When we're talking about the grace of God. When we're talking about the truth of God. Our joy should be full during those times. My personal opinion, those kind of Sundays are the closest thing we're ever going to get to heaven. Mm. We get to heaven, guess what? We get to have that an unending, eternal time of fellowship together with all the people of God. Can you imagine, as the song says, it is this joy unspeakable and full of glory. It will be a time of joy unspeakable. It will be a time when we will bask in the glory of God. John had that desire in his heart to go to these and to have that joy with them personally. Not just to write it in pen and paper, which was a papyrus at that point in time, but to go to speak these things and to have that personal joy with them. And then he gives this greeting here from, I believe, this, this church. The children of this elect sister greet you, amen. And, and certainly, I think it was a letter it was to let them know that this church loved them. Whoever he was writing this to, that, the, that these that were with him, that they loved them and they had a common bond. And what a, a lovely letter, a lovely thing that John has, has said here and, and, and a true thing that he has written here in 2 John, and affirming the truth out of 1 John. We rejoice in these truths. They're hard truths sometimes. We rejoice in the truth because it's it's God's truth. It's not our truth. And we, and we rejoice in this truth that He's given to us. And then we accept it and believe it and practice it in our life. Then we pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank You for Your Word today. Thank you for the truth of this book of 2 John. Father, we, we know there's some hard things here. Some very straightforward things. But Father, may we believe them. Lord, give us understanding in these things. Help us to put our doctrine to practice in our lives. Help us, Lord, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, even in, sometimes that involves believing and practicing things that are hard. I pray today that your word has been accepted by your people. I pray now, Lord, prepare our hearts for the time of the observance of the death of Christ. Father, bless us in this time as we come reverently to your table. In your name we pray. I'll take